So I did want to start by just spending a little bit of time talking about the title here, Mutiny in Space, Team Risks and Opportunities for Space Flight Missions. And mutiny is really an example where people uh, don't obey someone in authority and decide to do things differently. And it's a sign that there's disagreement or that teams aren't working so well um, together. And I want to talk a little bit today about the role of psychology and the importance of, I guess, the opposite of mutiny, which is team cohesion uh, for space flight missions. But I did want to just spend a little bit of time, give you about 30 seconds or so, uh, to think about how you um, might be able to uh, work out why psychology is important for space missions. So I'm going to give you about 30 seconds starting now to think about how is psychology relevant to space flight missions. Okay, so maybe you've had a chance to discuss and think about that question. We know that uh, some of the things that you might have thought about were loneliness, that obviously that astronauts in space uh, can feel lonely and they can feel like they are missing out on things back on Earth. And so loneliness is one of the things that they need to struggle with. Psychology is uh, sort of also relevant um, in space missions uh, because uh, it's possible that uh, because of sleep de deprivation and stress uh, that people can experience mental health problems in space. And it's also true that in space, our brains, um, the way we process information, the way we think uh, doesn't work as well in space. We're much slower in terms of our, our cognitive function and the way in which we think and respond. Uh, and so that can uh, take a lot of getting used to uh, when we're we we when we're talking to ast astronauts uh, that are in in space. We also um, know that psychology is important uh, when it comes to team functioning, the way in which we might select astronauts to go on space missions, the training that they will have on space missions, and also how they function together. Uh, as a team on space missions. So all of those things mean that different areas of psychology, uh, uh, sort of clinical psychology, cognitive psychology, uh, social psychology and organisational psychology are all relevant to, um, to what happens in space. I'm just going to see if I can email my slides uh, to Brad because he might be able to... Um, to help here. So we know that psychology is relevant for all of those kind of reasons and, and as a result NASA uh, has um, quite a lot of interest in uh, psychology and the way in which teams function in space. Uh, they've spent some time thinking about um, different types of missions uh, and the impact that psychology uh, might have. We also know that there's been some events in the history with NASA uh, that have led to more attention on um, psychological factors. Uh, and one of those uh, events happened in, um, 19, in 1973 and 74 on the Skylab mission, which was the sort of space um, station prior to the International Space Station. And uh, what happened on that mission is that the three astronauts on board uh, felt that uh, they were being overworked, they had too much to do, people were being uh, too demanding in terms of the schedule that they had, and so they decided effectively to go on strike and turned off their equipment uh, for a day and decided to have a bit of a holiday. I'm sure many of us have felt like that when we've been at work or at school, uh, and here is a case where um, 
the astronauts took a very high risk action and turned off all communications with mission control. And this really shows that there is um, an example of conflict between the teams, the team that's in space and mission control as a team that uh, is responsible um, in terms of mission success. And it shows um, us that things can go wrong in space and there could be some quite serious consequences. After this time, NASA spent a lot, uh, focused a lot more on some of the issues to do with uh, team cohesion and team conflict, uh, and spent uh, sort of more time thinking about some, what some of the team risks uh, might be in terms of uh, these um, space flight missions. NASA has now identified a whole range of areas where it perceives there to be uh, different kinds of risks. And one of those is to do with cooperation, coordination and communication and psychosocial adaption. So all of those aspects of psychology uh, that we have talked about already. Uh, and NASA has done some work thinking about what kind of missions are likely to produce the most challenges uh, for teams of astronauts in space, but also the relationship between uh, astronauts in space and mission control and how those groups are going to work together to have a successful mission. NASA recognises that the longer that humans spend uh, on space missions uh, and the larger the groupings of people that might go to space, the more likely it is that these issues of team cooperation, coordination and communication uh, are going to be a problem. And so uh, they're putting more effort and energy into understanding what are the cycles that teams go through when they're trying to um, act together well to perform a task uh, and to think about what some of the threats might be uh, to a team that might lead it to engage in more uh, conflict. They also want to spend some time working out how to measure team functioning. So if you're on Earth in mission control and you have, you're working with the team uh, and you're um, trying to work with that team so it's successful, what are the things that you might be looking for that tell you that, um, that the team's not working? How might uh, people on Earth and perhaps uh, fellow crew members uh, in uh, space uh, know whether the team is functioning well or not. And so we need better measurement um, to assess team functioning. There's also this question of if the team's not going so well, uh, we need to know how to introduce different, um, what's called countermeasures or different ways in which it might be possible to help the astronauts in space uh, to function better as a team. And so um, these countermeasures, what kind of training could people do? What kind of support could they get in space? Um, how might they be prepared before they even leave Earth to be able to function effectively? And when we've got more people going to space, not only more missions, there's a mission planned in 2024 uh, to go to the moon, to spend a longer period of time on the moon, and then to and then to um, hopefully move on to Mars. Uh, there's not only those kind of missions, there's also this idea of uh, space tourism, uh, where you can imagine in the future, people might go on a holiday uh, with a whole lot of other people and uh, travel around the moon and back to earth. And team functioning may also be important uh, in that setting. So we have some slides here. Thanks, Brad. So we're just, um, we almost had some slides. So there's the example of there are the astronauts uh, uh, with mutiny in space who had uh, issues on Skylab 4. This is the example of, of NASA's thinking about the likelihood of something happening and the consequences of something happening. Uh, and you can see that as missions get longer, um, there you can see sort of yellow versus uh, red. 
So yellow means that there's medium risk, red means that there's high risk. Uh, and, you know, as we are traveling uh, for longer, uh, the risks to do with cooperation, coordination and communication increase. And if you just go to the next slide, you can see, and you can go to NASA's webpage and you can see all of the types of gaps in knowledge that NASA thinks exist in relation to uh, team functioning. And at ANU and with uh, Grace Goodman, uh, Brad Tucker and uh, Emma Tucker, we're looking at investigating uh, some of these gaps and we've done some research already, in particular looking at gaps one, two and three. So if we go to um, the next slide, we can talk a little bit about how we study and how we prepare our teams for space. And we're really looking at trying to um, recruit not only the right individuals, but also the right groups. So even though we might have uh, individuals that have the right characteristics and skills and knowledge, um, the right approach to uh, cohesion and working with others, putting all of those individuals together doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have the right team. Uh, so perhaps we need to do more than just focus on the individuals. We need to be able to really work very well with teams and to actually select the best teams to travel in space. When we study um, teams, so how do we go about selecting them? How do we go about working with them? How do we go about studying them? There are a range of uh, techniques. Um, what's been happening uh, probably up until very recently is that a number of times a day, uh, teams uh, that are working together, that are preparing uh, to go to space, or if we're studying teams um, in other environments, which we're gonna talk about soon, sometimes there are environments that are created to be just like it would be like traveling to or uh, being on another planet. Uh, small habitats, delayed communications, um, different tasks that people have to complete. Uh, in those uh, habitats, um, members will have to complete surveys. Um, this is an example. This is the NASA uh, Human Experimentation Research Analog. So it um, has been used to test teams for up to 45 days. There's sound effects in there, it vibrates, there's communication delays to mirror the kind of experiences that teams would have traveling um, and being located, for example, on Mars. And so when we're studying teams in these environments, we would ask surveys, but increasingly we're being able to use technology in new ways to study these teams. Uh, and there is this idea that um, just the size of a mobile phone, people could wear that around uh, their necks and it could monitor the type of interaction that one member of the team is having with another. It could measure um, the mood perhaps by looking at facial expression and also the way in which people are talking to one another. These monitors could also assess sleep deprivation um, and general health of the astronaut. So technology is helping us monitor health, but also could be used to help us monitor uh, team functioning. So these, um, these new technologies um, are, are really um, starting to be studied very seriously uh, and giving us new ways to study uh, groups in space. So this is um, in Houston Johnson Space Center, but there's some other um, images here of other sites that are used to study teams uh, to try and um, mimic the kind of experiences that astronauts would have in space. Uh, sometimes um, the European Space Agency, for example, will study um, teams in high pressured confined environments uh, such as um, this CAVES training simula simulation. So people can be sent to unfamiliar areas and the way in which they solve problems, respond to stress, respond to space, uh, sort of restricted space can be studied and examined. 
Uh, there's also the winter over crew, I think is the next slide. Um, of course, in Antarctica, there are um, teams uh, that are at sort of research stations there uh, that are con uh, sort of their communications is restricted. They're in an, a more extreme environment over winter. And so at ANU in, um, and in partnership actually with the European Space Agency, we've studied uh, how those teams function over time, over winter, uh, to better understand uh, what it might be like for teams who are um, astronaut teams or for space flight missions. Uh, there are some other examples here as well, Brad. There's, um, um, uh, this is another example of uh, Mars 500, which uh, was located in Russia. And here they studied teams um, over 520 days. So the teams are in this uh, sort of confined space, this habitat. It was a culturally diverse team with Russians and Chinese, French and Italians. And they were studying uh, aspects of mental health, stress, sleep, uh, and how people were responding um, during this time. And again, they had communication delays like you would experience if you, for example, were on Mars, simulated landings, simulated Mars walks, uh, to see how the team uh, sort of functioned. So I'm just going to have a quick look at these questions just to see if there's anything sort of relevant to um, relevant to where we are now. Okay, I can come back to some of those questions uh, towards the end. So we can go to the next slide, which I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on. So this is data that comes out of the Mars uh, 500 study. And this is the kind of data that would be able to inform um, the astronauts themselves and mission control about the way in which a team is functioning. So, so on the y-axis, you have the score of the different individuals uh, that were part of this uh, Mars 500 mission. And across the x-axis, across the bottom, you have the number of days uh, that the mission uh, that was part of the mission. So um, we can see how every individual, A, B, C, D, E, uh, sorry, yeah, E and F, are the individuals who are part of this mission. And we can see how they're responding to these psychological uh, and organisational really measures across time. So you can see that at point zero, um, many of these individuals are starting um, at a similar point, but they're all reacting a little bit differently as you look at their scores across time. So you can see in relation to depression, this is the, um, so I've got a mouse here I can use. This is the, oh, Brad, you'd have to use the mouse, sorry. Um, the, um, you can see that individual E is suffering much more from depression uh, than the other individuals that are part of this team. Uh, and, you know, that is likely to have implications for, for not only that individual, uh, but the team as well. So if something like that happened uh, on a journey to Mars, what might E be able to do uh, to help them sort of better cope um, with this onset of this mental health sort of issue? You can see when it comes to the third one along, confusion and bewilderment, that uh, as the mission gets longer, there are individuals who are having more challenges uh, with some of that cognitive functioning, the idea that the way we process information and think, um, you know, might be affected by being in these confined spaces for a long period of time. You can also see how they're react reacting to stress, exhaustion, how tired they are. Uh, but getting this kind of information quickly back to mission control um, and being able to have confidence in this information that relates to how the team is functioning means that it's possible to perhaps intervene earlier or put countermeasures into place that are going to help the team uh, function better. Um, we also know from some of the monitors, there's some work being done at um, Michigan State University uh, with monitors, 
and they can see that people are spending less time with one another um, the longer a mission goes on. So it, also it was the case here that people are sleeping for longer or isolating themselves from others longer as the mission goes on. So this is the kind of information that we can get and we're working very hard as our other sort of teams and groups around the world to get a very high quality data uh, about the way in which teams are functioning because it is so critical to a successful uh, mission and successful performance uh, for, um, you know, for spaceflight missions uh, and getting to Mars. So there's also a few other sort of slides here, I think just, um, this is another site. Um, they've all got the same sort of look about them, haven't they? They're all trying to mimic the kind of size of spacing that would be available um, uh, with a mission uh, to Mars, the way in which we could get resources and what could we get to Mars. Um, and, and often they're going to be very small and people have to learn to live with one another well in those places. Um, this is in Hawaii. This is in um, Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. There are research teams interested in geology, which is what Penny uh, talked about, um, and also interested in how groups and teams are functioning in, the, you know, applying and going to this site almost all year round, um, doing different kinds of research and studies uh, that um, will help provide information for us getting to Mars. Um, there's also talk about a site here in Australia um, and if we had an analogue site they're called, because they're meant to be an analogue to what it would be like in Mars, um, we would be able to uh, perhaps do more research here and build on some of the expertise that we have in Australia um, to get a better handle on all sorts of aspects of, um, of a mission. Uh, but obviously myself and others at ANU would be very interested in uh, better understanding some of the team functioning uh, and the successful um, indicators that are going to tell us that the team is going well. And I just wanted to finish with our with sort of where the research is going. I don't know how many of you are familiar with sort of Star Trek Voyager and the idea that members of the crew are wearing a disc um, that can uh, capture and, com and they can use to communicate with one another. Um, you know, we, uh, we would, and their work is moving towards this idea of a smart monitor that might be able to assess sleep and stress, mood, how much contact people are having with one another uh, by looking at facial expressions, the type of emotion that uh, might be characterizing those interactions. It's also possible without looking at what people are saying to understand how they're saying it to get a sense of whether people are getting on well or not, how are they relating to the to leaders uh, in, in these particular missions. And this kind of technology, I think, will help us um, better understand team functioning in isolated, confined and extreme environments, ICE environments, uh, better inform the preparation of teams for a successful space mission. Um, help us better understand what other what things are important for team cohesion, help us train teams better, but also develop uh, countermeasures for a very successful um, a successful mission really and a high performing team that can achieve the goals that they have so that 's really the direction that the research is is taking so they were the main points that I wanted to make and thank you, Brad, for getting these slides up i 'm sure they 're um, helpful visuals to kind of see the kind of points that we're making here. So let me have a look at some of uh, the questions that we have. Um, uh, one question is, wasn't psychology included in planning for space missions before? I think um, certainly um, after sort of uh, the Skylab incidents, I think psychology and team um, aspects and uh, thinking about astronauts um, working lives and um, their, how, much how much they're able to play a role in deciding what they do and when they do it. All of that really came about um, after some of those events. 
I think psychology has always been there for recruitment, for trying to work out um, who's going to have the right character, skills, knowledge um, to be able to be successful in um, the NASA type program. So I think psychology has been there um, in those aspects. Um, I think it's more recently that issues of team, you know, scientific understanding of team functioning, how we measure team functioning uh, is, is coming to the fore more recently. What criteria is NASA looking for for the perfect astronaut psychologically? Well, um, a whole lot of um, sort of characteristics or personality characteristics uh, have been identified. Um, often that's about the individual, uh, but increasingly this idea of having a cooperative mindset. So this ability uh, to get on well with others and to handle uh, sort of stress uh, have emerged as being important in terms of what well, more important, I guess, or we've got better information about those things as being important uh, for the missions. Uh, so it's not, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot you have to be able to do. You have to have skills to obviously, um, you know, understand the equipment, fly, um, complete all the tasks that you need to do on such a space mission. But in addition, some of these uh, team aspects are also emerging as important. Um, you mentioned that in space, our cognitive abilities are more limited. What causes this? Um, ongoing ongoing investigation. Um, we know that uh, some of it is to do with the way sort of fluid moves around the body uh, as a function of being in a gravity or a no gravity environment. Uh, but certainly, um, if, so yeah, coordination, finger movements, all of those things are much uh, slower. Um, and also this idea that sort of it might feel like um, the way our thinking um, is going is much slower in space as well, perhaps due to this fluid, the way fluid responds and doesn't respond um, in an, a lower gravity environment. So what sort of countermeasures do they use? Um, well, uh, well, it's interesting. So some of the countermeasures, for example, with isolation um, have been um, you know, have been trying to encourage, helping people to connect with uh, with people on Earth. So when it's possible uh, to communicate, those forms of connection are an important sort of countermeasure. Um, making sure that astronauts have time um, to uh, sort of on their own um, uh, to sort of think and relax, that is seen to be another kind of countermeasure to deal with some of the issues of uh, stress and sleep. Um, there are, you know, ideas now that in fact you could set up um, remote training modules that uh, astronauts could do where they've got sort of high quality information um, while traveling in space that would help with some of the time that they, they have it at hand, um, that they could have, um, sort of mental health um, sort of training insights that they could access. They could also access um, team type information that might be helpful. And the more information they got about how their own team is functioning in real time, perhaps, um, the more they could perhaps do things that might uh, prevent uh, more serious uh, elements of team conflict. So, um, knowing how to resolve conflict um, and deal with these stressful situations could be very helpful. So, um, yeah, so this is a very hard question. What actions uh, would be taken if there was a serious dysfunction within a team? Uh, murder, suicide to prevent a failure of a mission, um, particularly if said, if the said individual was key to the success of the mission and survival of the other team members. Um, so you can see that at its most crisis point, um, there are some very complex issues to do with the way individuals and teams are functioning. Um, one of the solutions is to have what's called a leader full team where everyone is capable 
um, of leading the team uh, such that if something happens to one individual who might be critical uh, to the mission, uh, other people can step in and fulfill that role. So having some duplication or overlap of skills and abilities uh, could be quite important for mission success. Um, but you looking at that Mars 520 data, I mean, you can see that, I mean, that wasn't in space, it was in a simulated environment, but something about being in that confined environment, something about team relations, perhaps something about isolation, loneliness, um, certainly did lead that one individual to experience more and more depression as the mission went on. Um, perhaps monitoring that would mean that, you know, it might be possible um, to provide um, some sort of counselling and support to prevent things um, deteriorating or getting worse. Um, okay, so there's some other very interesting charts and it seemed there's a couple of people who perform relatively better than others. Um, yeah, so if we um, knew more about how people, if we knew that, if we had lots of teams in lots of analog environments and we were studying them, uh, we would be able to better work out what combination of people um, might be, work very effectively together. So this is all pointing to um, more team research. Um, how do we get more women into space? Um, so, and would Skylab mutiny be due to a change from a military base to a scientific base thinking of NASA? Um, are more women in space? I mean, I think there's, um, there, are, um, there are many women who've been to space and there obviously uh, is um, an well, not just an interest, a real commitment to um, having diverse teams in space um, that includes women. There's certain advantages to women going to space um, in terms of uh, in terms of their size and weight and being in confined type spaces. Um, so I think that there's lots of programs uh, working very hard to ensure that women are in the best position uh, to travel in space. Um, yeah, and I think you're right. I mean, this idea of the mutiny, one of the explanations, and I've got a reference list um, that I can share, but um, one of the ideas around the mutiny was exactly that, that the astronaut was almost seen to be like a piece of equipment. Um, and so this mutiny example led NASA to start to think a lot more as um, astronauts, as being sort of very um, valuable members of the team, um, that they actually needed to be sort of included more in terms of decision making and planning. Uh, and so there was a shift in this idea that um, the thinking about the crew kind of changed as a function of this exam, this event of mutiny. So we've got a little bit longer. Um, I'll just do one or two more questions. What can be done about dysfunction, depression or psychotic behaviour while in space? I mean, this is a very real question, um, perhaps particularly when we think about space tourism. Uh, and, you know, there are questions about whether the medicines that we might take on Earth um, actually work in space. So we, there's some research that needs to be done there. Um, and um, we don't know about the medication. Um, we certainly um, need to think about treatments, uh, including uh, counselling uh, and other interventions that could prevent mental health issues getting worse. Um, so there's another question here. Any chance of deaf people going in space? Would it be problematic? Um, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. I can't think of any, if there's methods of communication and abilities to communicate effectively, both within the team and with mission control, um, I can't see why being deaf would prevent people going to space. So are there, I think we're pretty much at time. I hope um, you found some of these questions interesting and 
the human factors, I guess, are a really important part of the puzzle as well in terms of um, having successful space missions. So thank you.